On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, it's the United States Navy and the Houthi Pirate War. I am your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So for those of you who don't know, I am a merchant mariner by training. I sailed uh, three years and then worked ashore for four years, but I'm also a naval historian, naval and maritime historian. And on my naval historian side, my favorite story, the one I love the most to talk about is the founding of the U.S. Navy, and in particularly the Barbary Pirate War. I mean, you can't get better stories than the United States Navy and the Barbary Pirate War. And there's a lot of parallels going on right now between those conflicts in the early history of the United States and what's going on off the coast of the Red Sea with the Houthi. We're going to look at that analysis. We're going to compare those two and discuss what is developing right now in this conflict. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, give you a little bit of a refresher on the Barbary Pirate War if you're not uh, up to speed on it. There's a lot of videos out on this. There are tons you can find on YouTube that go in depth on it. I may do one at some point. But my rundown is this. So one of the best sources on this and, and the early history of the United States Navy is Ian Toll's Six Frigates. Absolutely fantastic. Great book takes the early American Navy from the authorization of six frigates in 1794. This is the Congress and the president. Uh, this is the United States and the Chesapeake. This is Constitution and Constellation. Six frigates, one of them still in commission today, USS Constitution, up in Boston. Uh, Constellation in Baltimore is not that constellation. It's actually the very last sailing sloop of war built by the U.S. Navy. But Constitution is the original Constitution. And those six frigates were authorized in 1794, 230 years ago this year, because of the Algerian pirates. Algeria, one of the Barbary states, these are a series of nations along the north shore of Africa. They were subsidiaries of the Ottoman Empire. Algeria had seized 11 American ships, and to basically go in there and fix that, the U.S. under President George Washington authorized the construction of six frigates. Now, we're going to come back to that in a minute, what exactly wound up happening with that. After the uh, uh, authorization of those ships came out, the realization was that we can fix this without having to go to war. And basically what we wound up doing was paying tribute. We basically paid off the pirates. Uh, and they really weren't pirates as much as privateers. They were state licensed operators that sailed forth from these ports, Algeria, Morocco, Tunis, and Tripoli, and would attack ships, hold them hostage until the client state or the ownership would pay a ransom. Uh, at the end of the quasi war, William Bainbridge in command of USS George Washington was sent over to Algiers to deliver the tribute. Uh, he hated that mission. He hated it even more that he was forced to deliver tribute, not just to Algiers, but to Constantinople. And always said that if he has to deliver once again tribute to the Barbary pirates, he wants to do it from the mouth of a gun. And he has that, cho he has that chance not long afterwards when the nation of Tripoli starts seizing U.S. vessels. This leads to the decision by the United States government to chastise their insolence. And you see the dispatch of multiple squadrons of ships over. Really culminates in 1803 with a squadron under Edward Preble. This is the uh, diagram I kind of played with on my thumbnail there. This is Constitution in a fleet of American vessels bombarding Tripoli. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting and parallels that the US Navy and others are drawing from this is that we need to kind of emulate this. The problem is, People don't follow this story to the very end. The bombardment in Tripoli was not enough to get the pirates to stop. It eventually led to the landing of U.S. forces. Uh, this is uh, Lieutenant Presley O'Banion and a handful of Marines that are going to the shores of Tripoli. They don't go to the city of Tripoli. They go to the city of Derna. But they, along with a mercenary army, will seize and grab the city of Derna. But that in itself, the bombardment of Tripoli, the seizure of Derna, is not enough to end the conflict. Instead, we had to pay off the Tripolitans. We paid them off $30,000 to release the hostages that they had captured from the USS Philadelphia under William Bainbridge and to stop seizing American ships. And we keep forgetting that in some ways. A lot of people are talking about this piracy issue, that we need to emulate that. But the last chapter of that story is we paid off the pirates. Now, we go back again after the War of 1812. Stephen Decatur, who earns fame 
in the first Barbary Pirate War, promoted to captain, youngest captain in the history of the U.S. Navy at 25, will lead a squadron into Algier Harbor in 1815 because the Algerians started attacking American ships again during the War of 1812. He leads the, uh, the first of two squadrons. The second one is by William Bainbridge. Bainbridge gets screwed all the time. He is absolutely hammered all the time. The only time William Bainbridge is effective at dealing with pirates pirates is in 2009 when the uss bainbridge is used to cap to recapture captain phillips and kill four or kill three somali pirates and capture one decatur sails into algiers harbor and basically from the from his guns he tells them you will either stop attacking us or we will destroy your city your fleet he basically threatens the annihilation of algiers and and while that's effective i should note that the British and French were also putting a lot of pressure against Algiers. And a matter of fact, in 1820, they're going to come in, bombard the city, destroy it, basically. And eventually the French will colonize it and take it over. That's how you kind of get out of the Barbary Pirate War. And that kind of takes us to where we are today with the Houthi and what is going on currently regarding the situation. So we've seen a series of attacks for the fifth day. The United States is launching cruise missiles and bombs against the Houthi in retaliation for a strike. And let me be clear, the U.S. Navy is doing a you know, fantastic job in the military elimination of these threats. I, I mean, there is no doubt, I think, that no, we didn't think that use of tomahawks and F-18s and all these other ordnance would be able to deliver on target. The problem is while we're winning the military fight, we're losing the commercial fight because the Houthi, all they need is a few missiles to get launched and hit targets. And they are able to keep commercial shipping from going through because we have to understand the person we have to convince in this fight isn't the Houthi, it's insurance companies because it's the insurance companies that are making it too cost prohibitive for ships to go through. And we're kind of seeing that right now because we're seeing that with more attacks. Uh, this is a U.S. owned but a foreign flag Marshall Island ship called the Genco Picardy, hit by what is probably a missile of some type or a drone, not enough to penetrate into the vessel. Some people have seen this image and said, well, that looks like pretty light damage. Yeah, unless you're standing there or you happen to have the cabins here, or worse, this shell hits the bridge kills the uh, a crew up there, penetrates a cargo hold, ignites the cargo, or penetrates the deck and gets down into the engine spaces. So yes, while this appears to be nothing mere than a flesh wound, uh, it has a potential to be a lot more dangerous. And what we're seeing right now is the Houthi are doing much better at targeting. They're hitting U.S.-owned vessels that are flagged in the Marshall Islands, a lot of bulk carriers going in. Bulk carriers are still going through because bulk carriers are ticked typically low value vessels. It is the damage to these ships that have the potential to drive them out. Damaging a bulk carrier, which is you know valued in the tens of million, even with a war risk insurance of 1%, isn't enough to drive these ships out. However, if you're an LNG tanker or a, con or a container ship with hundreds of millions of dollars worth of cargo on board, a 1% insurance makes this voyage cost prohibitive. Here's the latest uh, UK MTO report on the attack of vessels. You can see right here the proliferation of the attacks in and around one of the most significant areas we're seeing growth of attacks is here in the Gulf of Aden. I can't help but note that the Iranian base ship that was initially based here in the Southern Red Sea is now sitting right about here. And we have a whole new series of attacks right here. So obviously the Iranians are helping out. This is the list put out by the European Union. We see it growing in terms of numbers of ships that are being hit. Uh, we're seeing more strikes directly against vessels. Uh, the most recent was a drone attack against a tanker, the Chem Ranger. But we've seen hits up against uh, bulkers now. And again, what we're seeing is more and more diversions in this area. If you look at the news report, Suez Canal diversions pile pressure on Egypt's economy. Give you an idea here. These diversions are impacting the Egyptian economy. On average, Egypt or the Suez Canal has anywhere from 17 to 19,000 ships go through annually at a half a million dollars a toll, although the tolls are going up as of January 1st, up 15%. Talk about $10 billion annually the canal makes. 
if it's only making half that amount, the entire Egyptian economy or Egyptian budget for the government is $100 billion. You're talking about losing 5% of the annual budget for the government. That puts the Egyptian government in a very bad financial position, which means the Egyptian government could become unstable. And an unstable Egypt can threaten the Suez Canal, can further threaten global trade. It's also on the border of Gaza. There's untold number of issues that come at play. And the Egyptians can't really intervene directly because if they intervene directly, then that seems to put them on the side of the Israelis because the Houthi are backing the Palestinians in Gaza and Hamas. Latest data coming out from the International Monetary Fund on disruptions through the Red Sea. You'll notice right here, this is the three-month chart for the Bab el-Mandab, the number of ships going through. On average, you're looking at between 70 and 80 ships. That inflection point is reached around 18 December. And now what we're looking into the data as of 16 uh, January, the number of ships going through is 37. It's usually 71 at this point. Massive reduction in the number of ships. If you look at the volume of ships coming through, again, a massive reduction over half we're losing over 50 percent of the tonnage going through look at the suez canal transits very similar right now we're looking at passages through the suez canal of 40 ship 46 ships a day down from 75 but if you look at the volume it's even more pronounced we're looking at almost a 50 percent reduction in the total volume of cargo going through and the way you determine suez canal tolls is by volume so this is significant Add to it, look at what's happening to the shipment of containers worldwide. Now, I am not an economist. My undergrad is a BS in marine transportation, so I do have an undergrad degree in, eco in economics. But I, I'm going to say that's a pretty startling rise of, of freight rates right there. We were at $1,521. Uh, this is the composite Drury Index on 14 December, $1,500. And we're sitting at $3,777 right now. That seems pronounced. If you look at the individual rates right here, <laughs> I, I, I think we're going ballistic, Mav. Uh, that's what seems to be happening with the rates. And this is all rates. If you look at the rates from Genoa, Genoa in, in November was around $1,300, $1,400, and right now sitting at over $6,000. If you look at Shanghai to Los Angeles, again, this is not going through the region at all, but people are diverting cargo that way. You're going from about $2,000 up to almost $4,000. Same thing with Shanghai to Rotterdam and same thing with Shanghai to New York. You are just seeing those rates go up. If you look at the breakdown down here, you can see how the composite index is up 82% annually so far. Shanghai to Rotterdam is up 174%. Shanghai to Genoa, 126%. Uh, Shanghai to LA, 88%, and Shanghai to New York, 64%. Understand, when we went against the Barbary Pirates, that was only affecting American trade. We sent the U.S. Navy to deal with American trade. This is global trade. And again, where are the rest of the navies in this scenario? I posted these images yesterday on X, and I also posted them on my YouTube channel. So if you're a subscriber, you saw these images. This is a Japanese uh, destroyer uh, escorting uh, one of their own ships through the region. Uh, this is a French frigate escorting ships of CMA CGM, the French line through the region. And this is an Italian frigate escorting ships of Grimaldi lines, an Italian line through it. Some nations are providing direct escort for their vessels through. The United States and the British are providing overwatch. They, they because of the nature of their vessels and the fact that they can sh destroy these ballistic missiles, they're set up as these gatekeepers around. They're not providing direct escort. As a matter of fact, on January 9th, that big convoy battle that happened when four U.S. ships came southbound, they were not provided direct escort. They were on their own, but they were being screened by the U.S. Navy and the British Navy, and there were, there were aircraft overhead. But they didn't have ships riding shotgun on them. But the big issue here is that we're seeing individual nations protecting their own ships, providing direct escort. That is something that the, con that the insurance companies are looking at. They want to see this stuff to be able to lower insurance costs. And what we're unfortunately seeing is this is expanding. Uh, this story over in G Captain, Europe, Africa, crude market tightens on Red Sea disruptions and Chinese demand. We're starting to see this impact in the LNG sector. We're starting to see it in tankers, and we're starting to see it in the bulk trade.
The Barbary Pirates War is one of the greatest events in the history of the United States. Really, a lot of the founding lore of the U.S. Navy is created. If you look at the Arleigh Burke class destroyers, there's a ton of them named from officers in that period, Porter, Bainbridge, Decatur, uh, uh, Preble. They're all named for those. They, they, they're, those names are historic in the history of the U.S. Navy. But I got to say, this is not a mission the U.S. Navy seems to be embracing at all. There are no embedded reporters on any of the ships out there. Send me out. I'll go out in a minute and report on this stuff because this is what you want a Navy to do. Protect commerce, protect trade. This is the bread and butter of navies. The problem that we're having right now is because of the increasing insurance rates. You just had the story the other day that the insurance companies may not want to protect U.S. and U.K. owned vessels. We may be in a situation where the U.S. and Royal Navy is protecting the Red Sea, and the only ships that are transiting there are Chinese, Iranian, and, China, and Russian. That's crazy. Meanwhile, U.S. owned, U.S. flagships can't get through. Uh, that is a big change from where we were when we started fighting the Barbary Pirates over 230 years ago. Got to look at this issue and understand that while you're winning the military fight against the Houthi, you're destroying batteries. You don't see them launching 22 missiles and drones like they did in the past. They're still launching single drones. They're still launching single missiles. And while we're neutralizing them, we're kind of knocking them out sometimes before they launch. Some of them are still getting through. And it only takes one catastrophic loss of a vessel to understand that. What the insurance companies are looking at is what happened to the tanker Limburg back in 2003. They're looking at coal in the year 2000, and they're sitting there and saying, yes, that damage that I so showed you before looks pretty minor, but it could be worse. And what an insurance company never wants to do, whether it's a car insurance, home insurance, or ship insurance, is pay any money out. And they sure don't want to do it for a catastrophic loss of a vessel, especially in the Red Sea or the Gulf of Aden, where the environmental damage will be catastrophic. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell to be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Well, you can hit the super thanks button down below where you can contribute directly to the page, or head on over to Patreon where you can become a patron of the page either monthly or yearly. Go next episode, Sal, sign it off.